Um, so a quick brief introduction about myself. My name is Shinmay. As Harish said, I am a CTO at Sabero. Uh, I also organize Hackware, which is a monthly uh, electronics hardware meetup in Singapore. Uh, we just had one two days ago at Hackerspace. Next one next month, if you're interested. I love everything that's sort of at the intersection of hardware and software. I've been doing this for, this, I've been working in this sort of intersection for about 15 years. And uh, yeah, you can find me here on, on, on socials. Um, I want to talk about our journey at Subnero uh, to sort of look at using Julia language as on an embedded system. Uh, it's a very strange, uh, it's a very strange relationship between Julia and embedded software. Usually embedded software is written in C or some kind of a low level language. But I'll go through the journey and uh, tell you how we decided to go this route and why and how it worked out. Uh, so a quick brief overview of, and context of what we do at Subnero. Subnero uh, is a local grown up startup. We uh, make underwater wireless devices. Uh, so we make physical devices and we, make, we, make, we write all the software that runs on them. Uh, and these are what we call software defined underwater modems. So these are uh, basically a communication system where all the communication bits are done in software instead of being done on hardware. So instead of what we talked about earlier with the previous talk with FPGAs and ASICs and all of those things, here we try to move all of the processing to software because it's much easier and you can update and configure and change things much faster than doing all of these things in hardware. But that's a different talk. Um, we run a lot of this stuff on physical devices, uh, Jetsons, uh, NVIDIA Jetsons, uh, and we use embedded Linux as the main operating system for these things. Uh, but we have to do all the signal processing and the numerical computation required for uh, the communication side of things uh, on the devices in software. So we created a framework called Linux Stack, uh, which is a network stack that does sort of your standard networky thingies, uh, but it, that's designed for underwater and does a lot of uh, special things for underwater codes. Uh, so the entire journey was basically talk, talking about how we should implement Linux Stack. It has it has a lot of special requirements, and that's why sort of how and what, like, which language we, we implemented it in was something that we had to spend some time thinking. Uh, so let's go look at what are the requirements. Uh, it has to be software defined, uh, which means it, it needs to do all the, the processing in software. It needs to do a lot of numerical computations. So we have to do error correction coding, a lot of math, basically. It needs to do signal processing, so we need to do uh, take all the data that's coming in, uh, process it, and then uh, process it further and, and deal with it. And we need to be able to work with hardware because this, the data is all coming in from physical hardware. And lastly, we need it to be configurable in field. So what, the, what does that give us from you know, the language requirements as to how we implement this stuff? So the software defined means it needs to be something that runs on some kind of a Linux uh, platform. Not necessarily, but it just makes life easy if you have an OS underneath you. Um, the numerical computing means we need something that's high performance uh, and also high level in a way, because writing very performant code, very, very low level, just gets very hard to maintain. I'll talk about that in a bit. And then we'd also like to have GPU access. The uh, hardware we run on, the Jetsons have GPU. So if we can access the GPU easily, that's really good. Uh, we, we, we would really like that. Uh, the signal processing uh, means that we need something that is low latency. It's, it's something that can work really fast and be able to deal with low latency scheduling and threading and all those kind of things. Uh, hardware integration means whatever language we choose needs to be able to do low level stuff. We need to be able to talk to GPIOs, talk to hardware buses, and all of those things. And the infill configuration means it needs something that is you know, scriptable and high level and users should be able to use it and maybe write some little scripts, a little bit like what we saw with P4 kind of thing. So we have this really weird set of requirements. We need to low level and high level and, and, and then also scriptable, but also you know, low latency. And that was hard to solve. And this is what, um, in a lot of real world scenarios, people call the two language problem. Uh, the, the easiest solution for this, which is what initially we went with, is a two language solution. So we have two languages, uh, one does all the high, high, high level stuff, one does all the low level stuff, and you sort of uh, mesh them together somehow, and that's your solution. So that's what we went with. Uh, this was about 10 years ago. Uh, and the idea was to use Java for the high level part and C for the low level part. Uh, yeah, 
So Java does all the high-level stuff, performance. Uh, people would think Java on an embedded platform, that's strange, but I guess Android has shown that Java is actually quite performant. JVM can run on very little memory and is quite performant uh, on, an, on an embedded system. It's quite scriptable. There's a, a JVM language called Groovy that we use, which is a sort of a scriptable version of Java. Uh, and then for anything that was low latency and sort of needed like real low level access, GPU access, we use. Um, this worked for us for a while, uh, but this, uh, this entire sort of tool language has a problem. And that's basically uh, the, the, the bit where they talk to each other, which is in this case uh, J and I is where it is, gets really painful because you, every time you change one side, you have to change the other side, and then keeping everything uh, you know, in, in sync and working just gets hard. Um, so J and I was rigid, it got painful, and basically we ended up not changing the C side as much, which means we, couldn't, we, would, we, didn't, we didn't add more features to the C, C side of things, which means a lot of the product features we wanted to ship, we couldn't ship, uh, or just were getting the um, <clears throat> So. Seeing this for a while, we were thinking, you know, we need to have a better solution for this. And uh, I've been following Julia Lang for a while, and by the time uh, you know we decided to look into this, it, uh, it was mature enough. Uh, so we decided to do uh, look at using Julia Lang for some of this. So who here has heard of Julia Lang? Oh, cool, that's sweet. Lots of people do. Um, so it's a high-level, high-performance dynamic language created at MIT. Version one in about 2018, which is about the time we started looking at it, so it was stable enough, uh, and it's open source. Uh, but it's really strange because Julia Lang is normally used in sort of the machine learning space. Uh, so why on an embedded platform? Uh, but it's got a lot of really interesting uh, characteristics for an embedded use case. Uh, it's super fast. Um, uh, it uses LLVM at the back for uh, native code compilation. Uh, it provides a lot of features in sort of I.O., process control, logging, profiling. Uh, it's dynamic. It's got some nice scriptability to it. You can write DSLs in it very well. Um, it is. It has a great community on the numerical computing side of things. Uh, and it also has some really nice language features to make composition of things very easy. But that's what you know, the website for Julia says. Um, for me, I think um, the interesting thing was the community was really great. I think Julia has a really nice community. Um, it's got a lot of uh, open source packages that are available, especially in the numerical computing, signal processing kind of things uh, side. So uh, we could use and leverage a lot of that. Uh, it's very low level uh, in, a, in a sense that you can actually very easily interact with OS and hardware. Uh, I'll show some of the examples of this later, but it's, it's, it's quite it, it makes life very easy when you're trying to do low level stuff, unlike Java. Um, it's got a great support for GPU integration, even on embedded GPUs, which was quite surprising to me. So you could, uh, and I'll example for this coming up as well, super fun. Uh, and I think this was really what personally took the cake, which was the community really cares about memory and speed use. Uh, memory and, sorry, speed and memory use. So the community always tries to run the benchmarks for performance and memory use continuously. So every package, every you know, every core feature, everything tends to have discussions about, hey, I know if you do, if you do it this way, are you going to do more allocations? Are you going to do more? Are you going to use more uh, time? And that entire uh, mindset is really useful in an embedded world because you don't have much memory. You need to do things fast. So having that mindset consistently throughout the entire community, I think, was really what sealed the deal for me. Uh, but yeah, it's not really easy to learn. Uh, <laughs> it has a pretty steep learning curve. There is a couple of very specific uh, new ways of thinking that you need to pick up, and once you once you have those, then it's straightforward. Uh, but it, it took me and the, the team quite a bit of time to sort of ramp up on this. Uh, but once we were get we, we got going, it was good. Uh, so what worked? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll go through a few examples of things that were that worked for us. Uh, so the speed of development. Um, so this is great for a very high performance code. Uh, it's very terse code, but I can quickly go through what you're doing. This is uh, where we are reading something from an uh, ADC into a buffer, uh, and then sort of reinterpreting it, and then sending it up to a callback to a, a, a high level function that deals with the, the data. Um, but in the middle, in the reinterpretation, we need to do funny things like take, take a 32 bit integer, shift it down by 8 bits, and then take a 24 bits of that and then convert it to a 32 bit sign integer. So, all of these things can be done in a nice and terse single liner. 
But the, the best part is while this looks very high level, this compiles down to something that's very, very uh, low level. Uh, there's actually a, 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 a media construct that allows you to look at what low level code you generate. generate. Unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't have it on the processor. I could otherwise I could have just shown you the assembly generates. But it's very short. So it generates very, very short, fast code, uh, even from something that looks very high level and complex like this. Uh, so things like the dot equal to operators do uh, uh, in place operations, so you don't even do allocation. So this entire code doesn't do any allocation, memory allocations, which means you could run this in a loop forever, and it's not going to uh, do any allocs, which means it's not going to do any GCs, which means you're probably going to be able to get pretty good speeds for these things. So stuff like this is what I think makes Julia great for high-performance code. Uh, Low-level control. So this is something that I struggled a lot with uh, Java, which was how do you do IOCTL calls? Because when you're talking to hardware, you got to you know you got to do IOCTL calls for random stuff, and then you got to go through JNI, and it's painful. Um, with Julia, uh, they have a C call, uh, C call function in their base library, which basically allows you to uh, link into any static uh, uh, C library or even do um, OS calls, uh, like an OS CDO call. And then all you need to do is write some data structures to what kind of data you want to pass through down into IOS CDO land, and um, then just call this. So this is basically your I2C write uh, in Julia. So, very easy to write, very easy to reason with, very easy to maintain, uh, even low level code. Uh, and then I think the, the, the great thing about Julia is there's a lot, because of the ML relationship and what people use uh, Julia for, uh, the GPU integrations are very mature, uh, especially on the NVIDIA side. Uh, so this is, for example, a simple function that does a vector multiplication. So it just multiplies X and Y and puts the output in out. Uh, and this code is just pure software code. It will run in Julia as is. So if I call it like this, it will just do this vector multiplication. This is 100% software, no GPUs involved. And all I have to do is add, add this at CUDA at the, at, the, at the beginning, and the whole thing is going to run on a GPU for you. Uh, so like, there's lots of magic involved to get this working, but what, you know, for maintaining code that you want to be able to say, you know, in certain scenarios, use a GPU. In certain scenarios, don't use a GPU. This gets really, really comfortable and convenient. So we, we really enjoyed that. But not everything worked fine. And uh, here's some things that didn't work. Uh, threading and channeling. So Julia, at least the earlier versions, didn't have much granular control over thread and channeling. And this came uh, in contrast with our requirement for low latency. Uh, so we need to be able to deal with that. The, the, we need to run that thread that I was showing you earlier, which reads data out of the ADC uh, all the time. Uh, and that can't block. So nothing else can block that. Uh, and getting that to work in Julia was a struggle. Um, so Julia uses green threads uh, because green threads are great for computation, but they're not great for IO. Um, so that was a struggle. Uh, it does depth first scheduling, which also means it's not great for real time. Um, so we struggled a lot with that uh, in the older version of Julia. In Julia 1.9, which is coming up soon, uh, they have some. Uh, so this is a problem that the community knows. Uh, so they have been trying to fix it in various ways. So the first solution they have for 1.9 is basically allowing interactive threads. We did come up with a solution for this uh, using some uh, low-level stuff that we had to sort of invoke, but it wasn't pretty, but it worked. But now with 1.9, we don't have to do that. Um, the other problem is <laughs> uh, this doesn't really have a standard approach to sort of bundling and deploying applications. Uh, it's designed to be used more like a REPL. Uh, that's main, the main use cases, and a lot of there is no sort of a bundling uh, uh, story for it. Uh, of course, nothing a bit of parsing counts, counts all, but in a production device, this is something that's very critical. Uh, and again, the community knows about this. There was a keynote uh, at PDECON last year which basically talked about this and how this is a big problem and the community to solve it. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a solution for that soon. Uh, and the third one, which uh, also uh, bit us for a while, which is that uh, Julia takes a long time to warm up. Uh, so Julia, Julia is a uh, JIT compiled. Uh, so the functions are compiled by LLVM into native code the first time they're called, which means when you launch uh, your application, it's going to take a while and compile everything, cache it, and then run everything fast. Uh, so it, you will get its speed, but it needs some time to warm up. It's a little bit like JVM. If you have used JVM, uh, it needs some time to warm up. 
Uh, yeah, so large applications can take up to minutes to start up, which is very painful. And in an embedded use case where you want to reboot a device and it needs to start working, that is very painful. Uh, there are some solutions around it. There's a concept of a system image, which basically just caches that, uh, that compiled uh, set of functions. Uh, it works with some success. We used it initially, and then with Julia 1.9, which is coming up soon, uh, they will cache this code to disk, which means as long as you don't change code, you should get fast boot up. So, uh, again, community knows about this. People are working on it. Um, so, hopefully, we should see some fixes for this. Um, so, while talking about while writing this talk, I was thinking, you know, we did this, we went to, we moved to Julia. So, what else could I put? Um, you know, people love Rust. Everybody's like, why don't you use Rust? Um, <laughs> well, so I, I mean, personally, I found that there wasn't much community around the single processing and variable computing side of things in REST uh, as compared to Julia. Uh, so, you know, we didn't have much to leverage on. We would have to write a lot of those things ourselves. Uh, so, uh, that was one of the reasons. We tried to go and look at Go as well, but it's even worse than Go. But although I do like Go's uh, multi threading side of things, there's a lot more there. Uh, we could have done a lot more there, but yeah, the, the, the library and the community is very different in Rust and Go. Uh, but yeah, if there's anything else that we, you guys think we should have used, uh, come talk to me later. I would, be, I would love to nerd out about these things. These are uh, stuff that I generally like to do and play around with Twitter all the time. Uh, so where are we now? Um, so 100% of the low-level code is in Julia now. Uh, so most of our device shipping devices run Julia for all the low-level stuff. Uh, most of the high level is still in Java and Ruby. The migration is slow. As in, uh, as in when we write new code, uh, it's written in Julia. A lot of the tooling has moved to Julia as well. Uh, but the embedded stuff, like the really low level firmware for microcontrollers, is still in C. I hope we can move this to Rust at some point, but uh, needs needs a little bit of time. So, <clears throat> as a summary, what's the takeaway? Um, what I really wanted to share with everyone was Julia is not just for large computers. Uh, Julia can work very well on you know small embedded systems, uh, you know uh, small Linux boards, Raspberry Pis, that kind of stuff. Um, it has some teething problems. It's new. It's only a ten-year-old language that's new in programming language systems. But I think it has a lot of problems. And I think if you are looking for a programming language that meets some of the requirements that we had, um, give, give Julia a chance. Try it out. Uh, it can do some really fun stuff. It's really powerful, and the community is great. That's all. Uh, and a quick shout out: uh, you're hiring at Subnero, so if you like this kind of stuff, uh, come talk to me. And I have some stickers for both uh, Julia and Subnero at the back. Uh, you can talk to me after. I'm, I'm going to be here the whole day, uh, and I'll be happy to talk about any of these things. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Shimmy.